All right, so um, we're going to go on here, but I want to mention one thing here. So I've got my my camera on. Now I've got my uh, I've got my app on my device, which I mine I'm I'm calling Kajiwara, my SDCE. I just chose a name, and then I and then I put it on, and it's right there. You see the little the little students when it focuses. So right there, Kajiwara, my SDCE. That's the app I'm working with. Now I've also got down there template app do you see the little icon again this is what I said previously that it does not remove your old version of your app if you're running this on a real device it uh, is a new app that's why it doesn't touch it last time the project was called com dot smith dot template and now it's called com dot smith dot my sdce it's a new app that's why you can have multiple apps in the App Store with the same name. Well, internally, they have a unique name. Now, notice this from a few days ago. Test01, Test01. Well, internally, one is probably has one unique name and the other one has another. You can check that by tapping and holding. If you tap and hold an app, um, then you'll get App Info. And if you drag it there, not there, drag it there. If you then drag it into your app info, it'll tell you internally test01 version 001. So this particular app is a different app than the one than the other one that's also called test01. So I want to make you aware of that that it doesn't uh, delete the old version. And if you've got these multiple ones hanging around there, well, you need to find out how to delete apps on your device, but most likely, usually the way it's done is you tap and hold. You tap and hold on your app. You tap and hold on your app, and then you're going to have at the top, uninstall. And you drop it into uninstall, and then you've uninstalled it. Mm -hmm. So let's say you uploaded your app to the Android store, mm -hmm. and now you, you want to change it. So you could probably upload one with the same name, and then all of your people that have it would give you functionality? That's exactly what you want. You don't want a new name because then now it's a brand new app. Right. So when we get to that in part three, we'll, we'll address those things. But that's exactly right. We want to keep that name consistent from app to app. You don't want to change it internally. com.smith.mystce2. That's a new app. You want to keep using the my SDCE, you know, the whole ID there in the config file. Keep it consistent always. We're going to talk about then releasing version two of our project and version three and how it's uh, how that process goes. If you're running a virtual device here, unfortunately, it, for me and a couple of people, it seems if you're running a virtual device, it seems that for some reason it crashes when you try to open the apps. If it's crashing like that, I can't do anything about it. But in there is where I would see the, uh, the apps to tap to launch it. And I guess if you can't get into that, remember, we can always launch the app through Taco and, and, and run again Taco Emulate Android, and that'll launch it again. It's a bit annoying, but we can do that. Uh, I think the Nexus device does work. Now, that one does require more RAM and resources and such, so... If you don't want to use this 3.2 inch device, you can close it. You can run your Nexus um, emulator back from the AVD mo uh, manager. And once the Nexus is running, you can use it. But remember, that's the one that was really big and you had to move it out of the way of the window and all of that. Now, I've got both my, uh, my virtual device and my real device plugged in. And now I have to make sure it, I send my project to the correct thing. So I have to type in taco run android dash dash device. And that forces it to go to the device, not to the emulator. It often does that. It goes to the easiest one, which is often the emulator. So back to my handout. We've gone through this pro part of the project about importing our app. There's still rough around the edges stuff that we'll deal with in a moment. Um, the big thing about it is that we need to uh, we need to also do part of this to the um, to the map file. I'll I'll do it a little later, um, where I need to to the map file. I also need to add. 
all of this meta stuff. But wait a minute, I deleted the index2.html. But I copied it into the index file. So this is not lost. Uh, so you would do that. We'll do it a little later, I think. Uh, we would add this stuff again to the map file. We would add the Cordova.js file, very important, to the map file. Take out the app mobile stuff. We don't need to do this other stuff. It's done. We've added the CSS to the, to the Kodika CSS file and the JavaScript to the Kodika.js file. We don't need to do that again because those external files the CSS and the JS files are both attached to the index file and the map file. So they're both, you know, taking in what, what those files have. So we'll do we'll work with the map a little later, but uh, we've got other things to worry about. Yes? Is there such a thing as an include file that would add that to the beginning of information? The include file, the, the way that it works that it's include is because we've got it in our code right there that actually references it. Uh, so as long as you've got some reference like this link equals style sheet or JavaScript, that's the include. Now if you want extra other extra files to be included on top of this file, there is a way to do that with CSS and I think with JavaScript, but you usually don't. You usually do note each file in its own line, its own include in its own include line like that. Within each HTML file. Yeah. So uh, furthermore, my handout. Okay, debugging with Cordova browser and Google Chrome. So if you use Taco Platform Add Browser, you can use Google Chrome for some debugging tasks. Now, I've mentioned this previously, and now I've got it in a little handout here. This particular app of ours earlier, when I did Taco Platform, confirmed that in this project, it has the capability to run as an Android project and a browser project, specifically Google Chrome web browser. Google Android, Google Chrome, that's why that works. This doesn't work with Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, etc. It needs Google Chrome. So if you're on your Mac and you're trying to do browser and it's not working, you don't have Chrome, perhaps. What I'm saying in my handout here then is we run Taco Browser and I've, you might get a message about saving files, click OK. You might get a message about storing files, allow that. And then we're going to open up the, the developer's tools. We've seen this before, but now I've got it written down for us and we'll look at it again. Let's go into back to command prompt. Let's type taco run browser. This works because our project has installed Android and browser. Taco run browser. What that'll do is it'll look for Google Chrome on your system, and all of these have it. All of these computers have Chrome. It'll take a moment, then it'll pop up. We'll get some feedback over here eventually. Because sometimes it's going to be a lot faster, especially after the first run, to in Chrome rather than waiting for it to run in the emulator. I forgot to start the emulator. Now I've got to wait two minutes three minutes, five minutes for the emulator just to start. Oh, I forgot to plug in my device. I've got to wait for that. Sometimes it's going to be faster to do taco run browser, and after the first time here it goes faster. It, bro it opens up Google Chrome, and for some projects it'll be quicker to debug things this way. So it's going to take a moment. It's coming up. The splash screen doesn't quite work. So that's one of the things. Don't worry about this. It's trying to load a splash screen. And it's confused. Don't worry about that. It's asking at the top, would you also like to store files on the device? One of the permissions that we installed a while ago, one of the plugins that we installed a while ago, was the ability for our app to save stuff to the phone and the SD memory card. So here it's asking us, would you like to allow this app to save stuff? Doesn't matter if you say yes or no, but I'm going to allow it. We've got our project. Again, it looks like a website like last month, but it is an app. Notice the web address, localhost 8000 index. It's running off of like a, a server in a way that's like an app. Um, furthermore, on my instructions, I say, okay, 
We've got some tools that make it look more like a mobile device in the browser. So in Chrome, I would hit F12 on the keyboard. It's going to open the developer tools. Sometimes your developer tools appear on the bottom and sometimes on the side. I like it on the side here. And if you want to switch between top and bottom of the developer tools, you can click on those three dots and select bottom, right, or detach. So if you're, if you're cool and have two monitors, you know, on one monitor put your dev tools and on your other monitor put your work. But anyway, that's optional. Mine is on the right. And what I'm saying here, open your dev tools, F12. In the debug tools, switch to console view. We've got elements, console, sources, network, switch to console. On that row of tabs, click the second icon from the left. It looks like a mobile device. Elements, console, and then on the left, you've got a little mobile device. Toggle device mode. Click that, and now your screen shifts over here to be kind of like the window of a mobile device. I've seen this before, but now we'll use it more effectively. In the mobile view at the top left, select device, like the Samsung Galaxy S4. You can emulate different devices. Right now it's just a generic size device, 360 by 640. If I go up here and then it said, okay, I want to see what does it kind of look like on a Samsung Galaxy S4. Doesn't quite change too much here. Okay, what if I'm looking at it on a Google Nexus 7? You know, it's a, it's a tablet that has more pixels. Uh, what about in, if I'm checking this out in an iPhone 6? Looks like that. What if I'm looking at it on, what else is here? A Nokia Lumia 520, right there. So I can kind of test this quickly on different devices. I can also go for portrait mode if you click portrait. This doesn't quite behave, however, because remember we activated in the config XML file to stay portrait on your real device. If you did run this on a real device, mine's running on a real device, and if I go horizontal, it's locked. If you're on a virtual device, and if I had it running, um, on the number pad, on the number pad on the keyboard, I press 9, and it flips over. 9 flips it like that. You might have to turn off num lock. If num lock is on, it might only flip once. You want to turn off num lock. So anyway, here on Chrome, it doesn't quite behave. So it does try to make it horizontal, but our app is locked to portrait. In the mobile view, do that. Click the browser's reload button, notice your console output. So Chrome has that reload or uh, refresh, whatever they call it, uh, reload. Click on that. It'll sort of reload the app at the first time. There's the splash screen that's not working. And I'm seeing that on the console here. Uncut module Cordova plugin status bar. Status bar is already defined. Okay, don't worry about that, but some sort of little message appears. Adding proxy for battery, camera, device, etc. So it's going to sort of fake that it has a battery, and it's going to fake that it has a compass, and that it has a file storage, and to capture audio. It's going to fake all this. It's going to create a, pro a proxy for it. And we allowed persistent file, file systems. We allowed it to save stuff to our SD card. And look at that. Cordova is ready. Didn't we program that so that if everything's good, we get a result? Cordova is ready. That's what our line is saying here in Notepad. Question. All right, let me see that in one moment. Uh, so what I'm saying is that what's appeared is in the in in the CS in the JS file we had written on line seven console log Cordova is ready. If it gets to this point, that means that the APIs it means that the Cordova code is is ready. And so I'm seeing that console output right here in the browser. Cordova is ready. And then some sort of error here about screen. 
that's what's getting confused. It, that's why it's not loading the screenshot. I don't think there's a, there's a fix for this. I haven't quite delved into it. I don't really care. I have tested that the screen splash screen does load up on a real device and a virtual device. It's okay that it doesn't quite load here. It's trying to load a file called screen, so it's not going the next step that it's actually screen-ldpi-portrait-jpeg. So I'm not going to worry about that. And notice then I get a little mouse cursor, like the tip of a finger. And so I can click, go to Art, go to Computers, Home, open that up there, Driving Directions. We have not done anything with the map, so it may not behave as well as it should, because we didn't add any of the Cordova code to it. And I'm getting some output up here. Google AP Maps API warning, sensor not required. I don't know what that means, but there's a helpful link there. I do know what it means, but if you didn't know what it means, sometimes it gives you back. Sometimes it gives you info to figure this stuff out. That's the point of looking at this console output. Sometimes we'll look at it in Chrome. Sometimes we'll look at it in the monitor. Remember that monitor.bat file. We'll get back to it later. But I want this output because when we deal with JavaScript, now we're complicated. Everything else has not been complicated. Once we get to JavaScript, now we're complicated because we've got HTML, which is not so hard. Then we've got CSS, which is a little harder, and then we've got JavaScript, which is hard. And now we've got all of those three moving pieces. We're going to be writing code to take a photo, to save stuff to a database, to check the accelerometer, and all of this advanced stuff. And the console will really help us to figure out our problems. Press back. What else do I have on this? Um, you know, open up some things here. We still need to fill in some stuff. We ran out of time last month. That's still not quite filled in. It's trivial, however. We've got all of this stuff here. It needs to be filled in. And one thing that doesn't quite work, latest classes. Remember, that opens up the latest classes from the website. In the browser, it opens literally another browser window because our code in, in the project still says open a browser window. When we get to this, we no longer have a browser. We have an app. So we have to rewrite our code a little bit to make our external websites open properly again. We'll get to that very soon. And if you try to open it in the you try to open it in the um, emulator or virtual device, it'll sort of seem like it works, but then it jumps you back to your browser, and if you press back, it may make your app crash. So we're going to talk about how to deal with opening external content in just a moment. You can see console log output here, as well as errors. To, to check your changes, you have to run... Uh, to, to do changes to check your changes, to, to do changes, um, I have to, you know, edit my notepad files again, save them, I have to go back to command prompt, and I noted here how we have to control C to break it out of its uh, browser mode. Type yes to confirm that. Up arrow two times, you know, bring back the last command, which was yes. Up one more time to bring back taco, uh, the taco command. So that's also a little bit tedious. We have to, you know, compile it again, run it again, then we'll see the results in the in the device. And there is a beta. There's a little bit of beta feature in Taco called uh, I think it's called um, what's it called Keep Alive something like that. Where when we do make changes to our code and save it, it does update it on the device. But as I've tested it, it's pretty buggy. Uh, so it doesn't quite actually update the app properly. So our workflow will be that we, we save it, we run Taco again, and we see our result. And it is tedious, but at the moment, that's, uh, that's our workflow. What I'm trying to show here is that once I'm in the actual virtual device, go to Art, click Latest Classes, it went over to the web browser. I don't want that. I want in the app to load a web browser in the app and keep me in the app. Technically, I've gone to another app right now. 
And then what do I do here? Well, if I press back, it may take me back to my app. It may crash my app. I want to avoid that. I want to create an in-app browser instance. You've probably seen this. You've been on Facebook app, let's say. You see a link. You tap the link, and within the Android, app, uh, within the Facebook app, it opens a web browser or it opens a video player. It doesn't jump you out to the video player app or the web browser app. You're still in the app. What I've also got here is debugging with a real device and Google Chrome, which I showed previously and now I've got it written. You have the ability to use Google Chrome to help you debug your real device. The catch is you need a real device running Android 4.4 or higher. You can also use Chrome to debug an AVD. So I would run my, my project on a device. I would go to Chrome. I would press F12. I would click the three dots. You know, the three dots on the top right corner here. More tools. Inspect devices. And Google Chrome will see a list of anything that's running an app. It sees the Android SDK. It sees that um, my virtual device is running my app right there, as well as the browser here is running in browser, and it sees my device. It doesn't name it with the it doesn't actually name it with the real name of the device, it names it with the internal name, which I guess mine is XT1528. <coughs> There's my real device there. How can I tell? You know, trust me, it's my real device. And then here you've got you know, a web view for your app. And okay, it's running my app. Inspect. So I'm saying here then. You will get a new view with your device at left and a console at right once you click inspect. A new view. There's my, there's my device. That's not the web browser. That's my device. There's Cordova ready. You can actually control your device from Chrome by interacting with it at left. Some things you do do not show up in the Chrome Dev Tools, like the keyboard. This is invaluable for troubleshooting the app. So again, this is running my real device. Watch this. Here's my real device. Here I am controlling it. I showed this off previously, didn't I? And then now, you've got it in the handouts there that it actually does it. So, things that don't quite work, like, okay, what if I press the home button right here on my device? Tab is inactive. It's not going to let me control, like, a non-Cordova, a non-Taco app, on the device. It doesn't let me fully control it. It just lets me control it once it's once it's running. And sometimes, you know, when you tap on some things, like if you're gonna later on where we're gonna set it up that a person can type their name and customize the app, it won't show the keyboard. You still have to use the keyboard on the device. And here on directions it gets a little confused also uh, on my actual device. It does show the pin. It shows the pin dropped on the map, but it doesn't show it here. When I get directions here, it's showing the actual line drawn of the directions, but it's not showing it there. I can interact with the map, zoom into it and such. And so there we are right there. Look up to the sky and wave to the wave to the satellite. So I'm bringing up all of these things on this handout because, uh, you know, we imported our project. We still have a lot of work to do. We're, we're barely halfway through the course. We still have, you know, two more weeks of stuff to learn, uh, you know, four more days of stuff to learn. There's still a lot coming up, but we've set this foundation up so far. The tools, the software, honestly, um, I've taught this class for three years, and it used to be a lot harder. You used to have to download. I had more handouts for you because you had to download the Java files. You had to download the Android Studio files. You had to set your path. You had to do all this stuff. Now with Taco, you saw the handout. You just basically install Taco and so forth, and it does it for you. This is how far we can get this quickly. Sure. Yes. Before you leave that. Uh 
handheld device. Can you go from the three dots again, please? Yeah. So I'm in Google Chrome right here. Three dots. More tools. And then inspect devices. What if you don't have more tools? You have to do this on the web browser of your computer. You use the Google Chrome browser on your computer to control the device. Don't go to the three dots on your device. Go to the Chrome browser on your computer. And then you can control the device. Um, so then I've got uh, either debugging in browser or debugging in uh, a real device. Uh, and now what we'll do is we'll go on here. What I want to do is I want to upgrade the I want to upgrade the um, I want to upgrade the in-app browser. Right now, when you click on the button over here to go to the latest classes, it's still behaving as if it was a web site. I no longer want that. Let's go to our folder where our project is at. So my apps folder in my project folder in my www folder and then we'll open the index file. <coughs> On line 142, we have a button called Latest Classes. Latest Classes is a link that goes over to the school's class schedule. Target blank, rel external, we did this last month, data roll button, we gave it an icon, bullets. So then we get the result right here, latest classes. I want that to behave more like a real button in an app rather than a website. And so, previously to this template, don't do this, but previously we did taco, um, plugin, add, Cordova, dash plugin, dash in app browser. That was from that big list of commands we did a while ago. Remember in the, in the network folder, there was a text file that had a huge long line. That was to ask for all of the permissions. Let us use vibration. Let us use um, the file system. Let us create a web browser in our app. You already have this. You can confirm this if you go back to... Go back to command prompt and type taco plugins. This will give you a list of all of the plugins this project has, and one of them you should see is in-app browser. So our project is able to do all of these things. Check the battery, use the camera, create splash screens, vibrate, work with globalization so that our app is multilingual, create notifications, all that stuff. So what we're about to do will not work unless we've added that plugin. We've added the plugin previously because inside of that network folder, that command is in Cordova All Plugins. So what I've got here, Cordova opens up a variety of features for your device now accessible to your app. We will use the in-app browser to open external content within our app. So websites out on the real internet, we can open them in our project. We're going to edit our Codica.js file. We're going to add it. We're going to add. We're going to add some code in the um, on device ready. Ninety-nine percent of the code we're going to write is inside of the on device ready function. Uh, and we need to edit two things, something in the JS file and something in the index file. We're going to edit the JS file first. Doesn't matter which we do, but we'll open the JS file. Uh, so go back to your project folder and let's open in notepad codica.external.js. 
JS, not CSS. It's very easy to confuse the two. Make sure it's the JavaScript file. So pretty much anywhere inside of our function on device ready, which starts on line 7 and goes to 16. We have console log, we have cut the splash screen, we've got a couple more event, event listeners. Whenever the app is paused, do something about it. Whenever the app resumes, do something about it. Let's jump down to line 15. My handout says so here's the overview of what we're going to do. We're going to write some jQuery. Um, we know it's jQuery because there's the dollar symbol. That's the dead giveaway that we're working with jQuery. So um, let's write this. Let's write this um, comment, so double slashes, and we'll write document dot get element by ID. You should recall this perhaps from I guess last month. Open close parentheses. Quotes BTN URL. That's plain old JavaScript. That is for us to um, access something in the in the project, it's not it doesn't exist yet. But we're gonna have a a button um, for whenever we click on it, we're gonna load a URL. We're gonna load a website. Click this button, load a website. Basically, what that's that's what's that's getting us toward. There is some element in the document that we will access it by its ID. Which ID? This ID. Um, and so that's plain old JavaScript. But we've got the power of jQuery. We've got jQuery attached in our index file, line 296. We've got jQuery. And the purpose of jQuery is basically their motto, uh, write less, do more. Write less code and do more with it. Because plain old JavaScript can do a lot, but jQuery can do that and more. You write a simpler command to accomplish a command that would be, you know, 40 characters long in plain old JavaScript. In jQuery, it's seven, as we will see right here. That's just a comment, it doesn't do anything. Next line, as my handout says, we are going to write dollar symbol, open close parentheses, quotes, and yes my handout's slightly different but indulge me a moment, pound btn url. That is equivalent. This top line is equivalent to that. No more dot, no more document, dot get element by id, blah 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 blah, dollar symbol. That's jQuery. Let us access something that has an id there's the ID marker. Let us access something in the document that's all contained in here, basically. Let us access something and do something with it. Now, if you recall an ID, we can only use once per document. And this is very important now because in, in our project, we've got multiple screens, but they're all still in one document. We've got the home screen, the art screen, the computer screen, but they're all in one index file. So if we were to name anything on the home screen, button URL. We cannot use button URL again anywhere else in any other screen in our project because in our index file, it only lets us use one thing named that unique ID. My handout has instead a dot. Pound sign is ID. What does the dot mean? Class. A class we can reuse multiple times per document. 
That's exactly what I want. Because on the home screen, I want to have a button to click on it to load one website. And on the computer screen, I want to click another button to load another website. And I can write code for each individual button. But the motto, write less, do more. I don't want to write lots of lines of code for each individual button. We can do that, but I want to write one piece of code that I can reuse multiple times per button. That's making our code smarter. We're always in search for the perfect algorithm as a programmer, the perfect way to do something efficiently and effectively. There, you don't have to do both. I could do something effectively but not efficient, and if it works, it works. But maybe I want to save myself some effort, I want to save myself some misspellings. And so I want to write the perfect bit of code, the perfect algorithm that I can use multiple times. And this is along those lines. I want to use a class. Any button that I attach that class to will then work with the following code. Let's then type at the end here, dot, on, open close parentheses, semicolon. The equivalent JavaScript um, would be, uh, I believe, on click equals function, open close parentheses, curly braces, semicolon. On, as opposed to dot on click equals blah blah blah. Again, write less, do more. On, when something happens. Um, this is also equivalent to what we've got up here, add event listener. Document when something happens. Wait for an event. Which event? The pause event. Which event? The device ready event. In this case, which event? When we click the button. We're going to wait for something to be called this to be clicked. So in quotes, <coughs> in quotes, right click, not right click, right click. Type click. Quotes, double, single, doesn't quite matter at this point. But we're saying whenever there's a click on this particular element in the document, do the following. Comma, make sure you're inside of the quote, uh, the parentheses. <coughs> and I have here then, function, open, close parentheses, space, curly brace, close curly brace. So, space function parentheses there be careful you're going to you're going to have two parentheses two closing parentheses right here for a moment but obviously one of them closes this one and the other one closes that one remember that's why i say close your pairs first and then fill it in you can easily forget did i close that or not if you just run all the way through space open curly brace close curly brace yes there's stuff in the middle but again, I close my pairs so that I don't forget to close my pairs. And there is an option in Notepad for it to close it all for you. But we're going to do it the hard way so we can learn it. And then you can turn on the shortcuts when you know what you're doing. When there's a click on this button, run a function. We will specify a function right here. A function is something that we define to, to do something. There's no such thing as on pause. There's no such thing as on resume in JavaScript or jQuery or anywhere. That's invented so that something happens, so we can accomplish something. So we're going to invent our own JavaScript command. So we're defining here function. We're going to invent a command inside the curly braces. So I have in here get URL. So we'll type. And these spaces here are a bit optional just for readability. Get URL, open, close open close parentheses so again, space here space there just to read it this can be all run together with no spaces and it'll still work but it's hard to read hard to read hard to edit later hard to debug we're saying once we click that button get URL get URL does not exist get URL is not a valid jQuery command or JavaScript it doesn't exist we're gonna invent it we need to also pass a parameter into it. This is the way that will allow us to reuse the same line of code multiple times. Because I can teach you in a way that we can write a line of code that will only apply to that button. 
and then we have to write another line of code very similar that will apply to another button. We have to then write another line of code very similar that will apply to a third button. And when I've got 40 buttons, I don't want to write 40 different lines of code that are all exactly the same except one little thing. I want to write an algorithm. I want to write a way that can be reused over and over. And one way is, is the following here. This, notice how this is spelled, dollar sign, open close parentheses, this. Inside the get URL, again, you're going to have you know, a bunch of these that look like they're duplicated, but it's necessary. Dollar sign, open close parentheses, jQuery. We're doing another jQuery thing here. Whenever you see dollar symbol and parentheses, that's 99% of the time that's something about jQuery. And inside that parentheses, this. This is something we run into often in, in most programming languages, or especially JavaScript, in that it will help us reference furthermore the thing that we clicked. The object that we clicked, there's a button on my app. And it has a bunch of parameters built in. Its width and its size, width and height, uh, its CSS properties, uh, has it been clicked or not. It has a bunch of built-in properties, and I want to access them. So I'm referencing here. I'm dealing with the thing that I just clicked, with this thing that I just clicked. I'm passing in all of the parameters, all of the features, all of the elements of the thing I just clicked, I'm passing that into my get URL function. I need to define what get URL is. So on the next line, I'll write, okay, that means function get URL, passing in the data, and then do more. So after this line, this is line 16, give yourself a new line 17, function. Now it's time to define what does get URL mean. So you type it again, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. That's the basic syntax to define a function. And a function is a, a sequence of JavaScript commands, explanations, you know. And I want to back up into the parentheses because I need to specify here. This function accepts a value. It takes in a value to do something with it. Because up here I'm passing the value of this into it. Whatever button I clicked on, pass its options, pass its, uh, it pass its uh, attributes into the function. So this can be called anything, but I'm calling it the URL. What I'm passing into it is the URL. That is something that doesn't exist in JavaScript. I'm making this up. It can be called A. It can be called X. It can be called anything. But I'm naming it something perhaps that makes sense. I'm passing the URL into this function to get a URL, to load a URL. I could have called this load URL. Call these things whatever we want. And because I'm going to define possibly more than one thing, I'm actually going to break my curly braces into multiple lines. So press enter to bring that curly brace down like that. We could keep it on one long line, it won't care, it'll still work, but for us as people and as programmers it's harder to deal with when it's one long huge line. Whenever we can, whenever is, uh, is, is useful, we should break our code down into multiple lines to, to be able to read it and understand it better. Now I do have some stuff in the handout, but let me uh, let me let's not write that just yet because this will make sense once we get into three. When I was writing this, I thought should we do three first or two first? It doesn't quite matter, so I'll we'll do both at the same time to extra confuse you. But it's all written down, so you'll get it. I'm not going to finish this line just yet. Save your JavaScript file and go back to the index file. Save your JavaScript, go back to index, back to line 140 something, 142. <coughs> On line 142, we've got the button. We've got the button that makes the website load up, but 
this is not the right way anymore. href, this is not going to work for us anymore. Um, on line 142, instead of it saying href, replace href, but leave the rest, replace href with data-url. This seems a little familiar from last month. Data role or data icon, data transition, etc. Data dash whatever is just plain old HTML5. It doesn't have any meaning. But oftentimes what, the, what comes after the dash has the meaning according to the context. Because I've got jQuery mobile, data icon means something because I've got jQuery mobile, data role means something. Right here I've invented my own one, data URL, that has no meaning to anything. It doesn't mean anything in JavaScript, jQuery, jQuery mobile, I'm making it up. But what I'm doing is I'm saving a little bit of data into my link, my object. This link, this button is an object, and I'm saving some data into it and I'm calling it data URL. I can do this for anything. I can attach data URL to class over here. I can attach it to the footer. I can attach it to this H4. I can do this, data-URL, and put in a web address for the purposes later that if someone clicks the footer, it opens a website. So I can invent this and call it anything I want. I can call this data-name and then write some JavaScript to extract that name and do something with it. This is very powerful. This is very, on the one hand, basic, but it's very powerful. I can save any amount of data simply by saying data and then doing something with it. So what I've done is I've saved the address. I've attached it to the object of this link. I've saved it here. Um, I guess I didn't write it in my notes, but we don't need target blank and we don't need rel external anymore. Sorry about that, make a note. We don't need target, we don't need rel anymore. So take out that whole target equals blank and, and rel equals external. Just take that out. The next piece of the puzzle here is, okay, we've got a button now that doesn't actually load a website. It will be triggered by the JavaScript. It will be accessed by the JavaScript. But at the moment, the JavaScript does not know that this button should pay attention that when you click on it to load the website. We've taken away the href. That was, that's how it used to know, click here, open a website. We took away href, it doesn't know that anymore. That's when it comes in that class. So when I said previously about IDs, it also applies to classes. I like to, and this is optional, but I like to add a class or an ID as the very last attribute of any object. Currently the data, data URL is an attribute, data role is an attribute, data icon is an attribute. I want to add one more attribute to this A tag right after data icon make sure you're still inside of the make sure you're still inside of the angle brackets we will add class equals btn url no dot don't put a dot there class means dot don't put a dot Okay, so now, in theory, our button will work again. We've got something that's going to behave like a button, but it won't do anything yet. We've uh, attached class to it, and then we've said this is the address that I want you to go to once we click on it. Now we'll go back to our JavaScript. Do you see this again? When we click something called button URL, get its address, and we're going to use it. That's what we're building toward. This syntax that we've got right here, we're going to use over and over and over. I guess this too here. This syntax we're going to use over and over and over. Something will be a trigger 
to accomplish something. This syntax we will use so many times over with some variation here and here and here. Let's go back to line 18. We're not done with what does it mean to get URL. And that's back to line 2 here. Cordova dot in at browser, notice how it's spelled, dot open. Cordova, the Cordova object, dot in app browser, the child object, dot open, the method, Thank you. 